Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Keith. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Keith. Oh, oh boy. So... Yeah, I've known that I'm an alcoholic since I was a teenager, I think. I, uh, when I was 15, was pretty heavily into drugs and alcohol on a daily basis and would, like, you know, ditch school a couple times a week so that I could just hang out and get high all day. I think I really first realized it when we were, like, out in the middle of the desert on Wednesday at like 2 a.m. building a bonfire so that we could finish drinking our beer and not be too cold. I don't think that was like typical teenage behavior, at least not on a Wednesday. I think a lot of people were doing similar shit on Friday and Saturday, but like Tuesday and Wednesday, I was there. You know, and then of course you need the speed to keep you up all day the next day. I had a lot of... um really bad consequences as a result of my drinking and using sort of very early in life. I got arrested a bunch of times before I was the age of 18. I had a lot of physical consequences. Um, In fact, one night I smoked so much crack that I burned a hole in my trachea. And I had these weird bubbles under my skin. At like 7 in the morning, I discovered them and went to show them to these two girls that lived with me at the time. And One of them literally ran out of the room screaming. And I was like, oh, maybe this is worse than I was thinking. And then I like went to the ER and the doctors took some x-rays of my chest and they were like, your chest cavity is filling up with air. We think your heart's going to stop. We need to sort of put a hole through there to let all the air out. (laughs) And, you know, that, that was, I think what most normal people would think of as a fairly extreme kind of event. And, like, for me, it was just, like, Tuesday. And, like, I went home and got drunk afterwards, you know, because that's that's how I do. Um, I sort of switched lanes on the addiction superhighway a number of times. <laughs> During high school, it was really, like, a lot of methamphetamine. And then from, like, 18 to 21, it was a lot of crack. And then I had that incident and decided, like, crack is, like, a problem. And so, like, I can't really use crack successfully, and I can't really use meth successfully. So the things that it's kind of okay for me to do are, like, drink and smoke pot, right? And for a while, that was, like, okay. I didn't have the kinds of consequences right away from that that I had had beforehand. And it took a while for that to catch up with me in the way that the other stuff did. But catch up with me, it did, and in a really, really kind of nasty way. I managed to, like, build up all the accoutrement that you build up in a normal life. You know, I I had, like, diplomas, wife, kids, house, cars. The only only things from that list that I still have are, like, diplomas, and the only reason I still have those is because they can't really take them away because they (laughs) fuck up, you know? And, yeah. Shit got really bad. I... For like the last 10 years of my using, it was not in any way fun at all. I would wake up and get loaded immediately because like the fear and pain of like being awake sucked. And I kept doing more things during the day that made that fear and pain even worse. There was actually a period of time where when my phone would ring, I would literally like hide from it. I didn't like turn off the ringer. I wasn't quite intelligent enough to do that anymore. (laughs) The thing I did was literally like cower on the other side of the room and wait for it to stop ringing. I was deathly afraid to speak with people like my parents or like my creditors, you know, and I, I, yeah, I stopped really being able to communicate with other people like on any level. Um, I was really like deathly like afraid and sad on a constant basis. 
someone in my immediate family convinced me that I should go to rehab. And I didn't think of it as like going to get sober or going to deal with my drug problem. I went because I wanted them to shut the hell up. And I thought, you know, while I'm there, it'll fulfill two purposes. Like I'll get this person the hell off my back and my tolerance will go down. So I'll be able to get loaded cheaper when I come out. And it, in that way, it kind of did work. But when I got out and I started getting loaded again, that lower tolerance lasted for about a day. And the person being off my back lasted about three days until they discovered that I was using again. And stuff got much worse. And I, I had this message in my head that I didn't have to be where I was. And it got somehow put in there while I was at rehab that, like, there was sobriety out there and that people were living without doing what I was doing. And that made it much more painful to be doing what I was doing. But that doesn't mean that I was able to easily stop. Um, a couple months after that, I got like a random phone call from that same rehab saying like a little bird told us that you might want to come back. <laughs> and uh, I burst into tears and I, I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't even stop crying long enough to actually answer them. I, I was so desperate for something different than what I had. It was just an unbelievable like God shot. Like, yes, this is what I need, and I'm totally not able to reach out for it in any way. It turned out that my family had been, like, planning an intervention, and that the rehab fucked it up by calling me prematurely. <laughs> I'm so happy that they did. Uh, I didn't have to go through that shit. I can't imagine what that would have been like. But, um, yeah, I went to rehab. That was July 13th, 2012, which was my son's birthday. And I haven't had a drink or used a drug since. I managed to get sober and stay sober there, and I managed to learn about some tools that helped keep me sober. When I first got out, like I had that like siren going off in the back of my head several times a day telling me it's time to get loaded now. You need to do it. It needs to happen now. And there was no way to turn it off. And my solution to that was to go to a meeting. I found that by the time the meeting was over, the siren had stopped going off and that I could sort of sit peacefully with myself for a little while. That meant that in those first, like, six months, I went to, like, four meetings a day because I needed that. Not everybody does, but I sure as hell did. And they tell you 90 and 90. I, I must have gone to 390. I really, I went every time that my brain said, we need to use now. And I, I didn't really make use of the program at first. Like, I came to meetings, and I'd put up my hand, and people would call on me, and I would tell them how much my life sucked. And I would tell them how bad things were, and I would ask them for pity. And that got old. Everybody got tired of hearing it. At one meeting, an old guy came up to me after the meeting and said, you need a sponsor. I'm going to introduce you to this guy over here. And he introduced me to that guy, and that guy said, you fucking sponsor so that, that old guy ended up sponsoring me. We were, we, we, we were like nothing alike. He, I, I had this dialogue that I had to have a sponsor that was just like, just like me, you know, like divorced with kids and looked similar. And he was none of those things. He was, but he was my sponsor and he walked me through the 12 steps my first time and kept me sober for that first year. And then I found someone that, with whom I had a better, like, platonic relationship, right? Like someone whom I was, like, friends with and whom I admired and who I really wanted what they had. And I've been working with that guy ever since. Um, life's been pretty fucking good so far. You know, I, uh, it's not that bad things don't still happen. They really do. All the goddamn time. And they suck. But rather than making them worse by drinking and using more, like, I deal with them now, and I know how to deal with my emotions that I have now. And, like, I've learned all the stuff I've learned basically from AA and from working with a sponsor and reading the big book and doing all the stuff. And, you know, it's been a damn good ride. It's not always, like, happy, fun time, but it's, it's great. It's something I hadn't imagined that I could have a life where I am sober, deal with my problems, and do things that are esteemable. A friend of mine says, if you want self-esteem, you have to do esteemable acts. 
Yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I have self esteem these days, and I do esteemable acts, and I do things that I hadn't imagined myself doing. I am actually a teacher, both at a high school and at a college, and that's something that drinking and using me would have thought is like beneath me in a way, which is just goddamn bizarre, isn't it? Like, there's a part, there's a little voice in my head from my father, like, you're better than that. It's like, what do you mean? That's, yeah. Anyway, life is good. I'm going to turn you over to Megan. <laughs> Hello, I'm Megan. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Megan. And, um, <coughs> thanks, Keith, for your share. Um, I like hearing your share. Um, yeah, so <laughs> um, I want to start out by saying that um, I really, I really would not be standing here today if it weren't for AA, and, and that AA has saved my life, just one hundred percent. Like it might sound cliche, or it might sound like everybody says that, and that's fine. Um, but I, I, it absolutely is true for me, um, and I wouldn't be here without it. Um, and um, life today is pretty freaking great. I'm employed. Um, I make car payment. Um, I do regular life things. Um, <laughs> I have a home. I pay rent. I do, just, um, yeah, it's kind of amazing just to like complain about things like traffic. I'm sort of grateful to just be able to complain about things like traffic. It's kind of awesome to complain about that. <laughs> um, so, um, I am married now for the second time in sobriety also, which is also rad. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and also, you know, it's just, um, it's very different than my first marriage, let me put it that way. Um, so I want to say that to begin with, just to start out. Um, I'm probably just, I'm just going to stick to the, to the normal, um, layout format of, of, of the sharing of how, what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Um, what it was like, um, was I can, I can, I do want to start in my childhood just a little bit, just to say what kind of person I am and how I grew up. I, I grew up, um, with divorced parents that got divorced when I was a baby. So they were never married in my eyes. I never saw them married. In fact, I, if you had spent a minute in the room with them together, you'd wonder how I ever got here. Um, they were very different people from each other. Um, and, um, uh, my father was, and I say was because he's dead now, but my father was a, a raging alcoholic. Um, and my mom is, um, she is a workaholic codependent person who, um, works all the time. And then, and then swoops into any and all family problems and saves the day and, and fixes all the things, but like, isn't always there or wasn't through my childhood, always there for me <laughs> when little things were happening or, you know, um, growing up my, with my dad, my parents had, um, joint custody of me. So they split the custody. So I lived three years with my mother in Sacramento. And then I would live three years with my father in Los Angeles. And then I would go back to Sacramento and I'd go back to Los Angeles and I was so young that I didn't realize that my father, I didn't realize what my father was. I didn't know that, that the way that my father drank and raged was bad or that it was something that I needed to say something about. I didn't know that I could have asked for help because I was a little kid and I didn't know. Um, so I grew up, you know, um, half and half and it really, I grew up not feeling safe. And I, I grew up not feeling like the people who are supposed to be sort of protecting me and taking care of me were doing that. That's not what they were doing. <laughs> um, so it was hard and I'm, I'm not blaming them for my alcoholism. I'm, that's not what made me an alcoholic growing up like that is not what created my alcoholism. I have a disease, um, the disease of alcoholism and that is runs rampant in my family, both sides. Uh, my mom is the eldest of 11 children Six of them are alcoholic addicts, and my father, um, he and his brother are both, were both alcoholics, um, and 
my dad's mother was a pill popper before they had a name for that. And my, you know, blah, 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 back, back it goes, you know, it's both sides of my family. So, you know, I had a 50, 50 chance or maybe more of becoming an alcoholic. Um, and so I, I grew up, um, feeling sort of like I was inside looking out a window at people wondering how they were being normal and how, how could I possibly ever fit into with these people? Cause I don't, I don't fit in here. I don't belong with these people. Other girls were an enigma to me throughout my entire childhood. I could never understand popularity. I could never understand how the girls all got along. Like I just didn't get it. Um, and, and that has followed me a little bit. I have a hard time being close friends with women. I have a hard time just, you know, doing that. And the best time I've had with it, honestly, has been in the rooms because I've been able to sit down and be honest with the other women about what I'm feeling. And lo and behold, many of them have had the same feelings I have had. So that's been cool. Um, so yeah, I grew up with that and, um, and, um, just not sort of not feeling safe. Um, one of the things that I took with me from my childhood was that I did not want to be like my dad. I did not want to act like my dad. I did not like, I did not want to drink like my dad. I did not want to be sloppy and ragey and any of that stuff. And so I was a late bloomer as far as drinking myself because I was determined not to be like my dad. So I'm 42 now. Um, I started drinking when I was about 25, 26. And I, I just, you know, I'd had a couple drinks in high school. Um, I did never had that. Those were not the kind of drinks that where I was like, whoa, I'm there. Um, I didn't have that experience. Um, I started drinking and I was about 26 and, um, it was with a roommate that I had who came home from some event that she had worked and she came home with, I think like 12 bottles of vodka. And I, she's like, you have to help me drink this. <laughs> and I was like, okay. You know, I didn't think anything of it. Right. Um, but that's when it hit me. That's when it hit me. I will, I, that I will never forget. I started having vodka and cranberry sort of every night for about a week. And then I started, you know, adding to that and very, very quickly, um, in my drinking within the first year <laughs> of, um, within the first year of my drinking, I was tired of having, um, alcohol out of a glass. I wanted it out of a plastic bottle that was hidden somewhere. Um, and I wanted it, to, I wanted no one to know about it. And I wanted to like have it everywhere that I was. And really there began my, my alcoholic drinking career, literally in my closet. Um, I, I stashed bottles. I stashed them everywhere and I drank when I could and I would sneak and I loved sneaking and sneaking around and having it and getting it and nobody knew wahaha kind of thing. Like I really sort of got off on the like sneaking around at first kind of thing where I just was like, nobody knows my little dirty little secret. And, um, but, um, that, that, that any happiness that I was getting out of that lasted very short period of time. Um, what I, what I realize now is that that feeling that I'd always carried with me, any feeling, any and all feelings of being Megan, of feeling not good enough, of not feeling safe, of not feeling like I belonged anywhere, any of those feelings. Um, I didn't realize that what I was doing wasn't getting rid of them, but just making it so that I didn't care about the feelings anymore. I, I just sort of tried to erase myself as much as possible. And the more I could erase myself, the more. I did it, you know, and the more I drank and, um, yeah, my, my drink of choice was always vodka. It was always straight and it was always out of the cheapest fucking bottle that I could find. <laughs> like, that's just the way that I drank. And, um, believe it or not, I had a career at this point and, um, I was a stage manager. I used to work in live theater and, um, and I, I got married and, um, my ex-husband, um, I don't know how he didn't know what I was doing. I just don't know. And maybe he's, maybe he's lying to me to this day that he didn't know, um, what I was doing, but sneaking and sneaking and, 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 and just being oh so coy. And, um, I want to add also at this point that I, I am, I was very quickly a blackout drinker. I would often drink and not remember anything that I did. And that progressed. Like I, I would say, from my alcoholic drinking, I would say I don't remember 50% of what I did. Like, I don't remember lots of stuff. Um, 
And my ex-husband thought, oh, I just thought you were crazy. <laughs> um, but, but, but yeah, but I was, you know what I mean? Like, it's not really a lie. I was crazy. Um, and, um, and I would, you know, would do things like, I knew the blackouts were coming, and this is when I, before I actually got married, um, and I was still living not with him at the time, but I would do things like get online and do stupid stuff, or, or call people and say stupid things, or text people with stupid stuff. So I used to have one of those little flip phones, and I used to, <laughs> I started putting a post-it on it that said, no in Sharpie, and then I would tape it shut, like, with all the scotch tape around it, and think that that would prevent me from somehow, like, embarrassing myself, you know, by, like, texting my boss or something, or calling one of the actors in a show I was working on, or, and, um, the, you know, next day the phone would be open over here, and the wad of paper and tape would be over here, and I would have done something completely ridiculous, so the initial consequences were hangovers and, um, and, and making an ass out of myself were the initial consequences of it. And then it turned into, um, the physical, the physical pro the physical stuff became really quickly, really quickly, very bad for me. My hands shook like a leaf all the time. And I was always like holding onto things or making sure they were like this or holding my hands like that or anything to like not, because if, as soon as I put my hands out, they'd just be like this, you know, and, and, um, my, my, my physical addiction to, to alcohol very quickly became that within a few years. Um, and, um, throughout my marriage, so I got married and I had a career and, and throughout my marriage, I was constantly hiding. But, um, one day, (laughs) one day, um, I thought my husband went to, um, uh, Costco and I, I did what I did do, which, you know, at the time, which, which was to get out my bottle of vodka and pour it into a plastic water bottle so that I could carry that around with me. And so people thought I would have water with me and it would just be straight vodka. And, um, and he forgot something in the house. And I'm standing in the living room with the plastic water bottle and a bottle of vodka <gasps> like this, and he opens the front door. <laughs> And I'm standing there pouring vodka into a plastic water bottle. And my husband goes, what are you doing? And I blurted, I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) (laughs) And and so, so my marriage had to end. I mean, honestly, it's funny, but that's like what happened after that. Like, um, I, you know, my husband was like, okay. And he poured out any beer in the house and he poured out all the alcohol and he was like, where's all your bottles? And I handed the bottle over to him and, you know, and I, I said, I hit it here and I hit it here, but I didn't tell him all the places. And he poured out, you know, a bunch of alcohol. And I told him I would start going to meetings and very, and, um, and, uh, I really, there was part of me that wanted to. I mean, I knew about AA because a lot of my family members got sober before me, including my father. And um, I knew about AA, and I did go to a couple of meetings, but mostly what I did was, um, mostly what I did when i tell them I'd go to a meeting was get in the car, and I was so, what they say in the book about any lengths, you know, to, for your sobriety, I went to any length to maintain my, you know, my alcohol, to make sure that I had my alcohol. So I would drive around in my car and add mileage to it to make sure that if he looked at the odometer, it would look like I actually went to a meeting, that I had actually driven somewhere. I would drive around in circles and I would go get some drinks and I would come back and I would sit there with my bottle of vodka and sit in the parking lot and drink it, hide it in the bushes, whatever, somewhere outside the house and go back in and tell them I'd been to a meeting and I'd be drunk off my ass. And so that's kind of like what happened in my marriage. And eventually, um, eventually I just couldn't keep up with myself. I just couldn't keep up with myself, the lying and the drinking and the constantly staying drunk. Um, at this point I started drinking at work. I was starting to drink at noon. It wasn't just in evenings. I was drinking now noon. I was drinking as soon as I could. And, um, and I was, and I started to be sick a lot. And, um, and I had some, I had a crazy episode, um, that I vaguely remember. It's sort of a brownout, but I, was threatening suicide and being all crazy in the house. And my husband called the cops on me and had me handcuffed and put in the back of a police car, you know, and just like, like in my own front yard, like I got, you know, 
carted away by the cops from my own husband. <laughs> and um, the, lo- the, the short version of that, you know, is that um, I... I didn't want to get sober. I wasn't ready to get sober. And really, I couldn't imagine how I could possibly live without being drunk. I just didn't understand how I could possibly. I didn't understand. There was no way that was going to happen. And the only way I was going to get out of the situation I was in was not to quit drinking, but was to leave my husband. And that's what I did. And I left him to be drunk. And I... um and I had, I was living in San Diego at the time through all of this. I had been living in San Diego and I was married in San Diego and, um, I left and I didn't just leave. I slept with a bunch of people first and I, I slept with a member of my own wedding party. I slept one of his best friends. I slept with some guy in a cast of, on a show. I was running follow spotlight on a show and I slept with some actor and I, I just, lost my shit, you know, and I went, I went home to visit my mom in Sacramento and I I discovered a person I had gone to junior high with this guy and, um, he's an addict alcoholic too. And I slept with him and then I just left my husband, moved to Sacramento and just started like being with this weird guy. Like, that's what I did. I just drove away, put my stuff in the thing in the truck. And, um, I asked this guy from Sacramento to help me move up North And, um, and that's what I did. And I connected with him and he, um, I'm not supposed to call other people addicts and alcoholics. I realize like people have to come to that conclusion for themselves, but I'm pretty damn sure he's an alcoholic addict. (laughs) And, um, and he beat me up and he was a shithead to me. He was really awful. And I let my, I just let myself be in this situation because I didn't care about myself and my self-worth had gone completely down the tubes. My career was gone my life in San Diego, everything that I built up down there, that was gone. And um, this is the point in my life when um, I started, this is about the last three years of my drinking, where I, um, cool, good. Okay, so we're going to get there. Okay, um, so I um, I was drinking in the morning. I was drinking as soon as I woke up. My mother, my codependent mother, amazing codependent mother, was paying for my apartment. I wasn't paying rent. I didn't have a job. Um, I had, um, my grandmother was giving out money at this point to all the grandkids and I had a bunch of money and I spent it all on alcohol. That's all I did. And, um, and I was drunk first thing in the morning and I was drunk all day and I was drunk all night. And I, um, I thought as long as I stay inside and don't go anywhere, I'll be fine. And then I would wake up to notes on my door saying, if you ever do that again, we're going to evict you. And I wouldn't remember anything that had happened. Um, So that was like the beginning of the really, really bad downward spiral. Um, At at the end of 2013, I, uh, there was a day when I couldn't keep alcohol down anymore and I would throw it up and I would try to drink it and I would throw it up and I would try to drink it and I couldn't keep it in my system and my body required it at that point. And so I went into DTs, really horrible DTs, hallucinations, all this stuff. And I called my mom and she took me to the emergency room and they told her I was probably going to die. And I was in a coma for seven days and I barely skated out of that one alive. <laughs> but I, um, but I did. And, um, drugs are not a part of my story, but I do want to say this regarding drugs as an alcoholic. Um, when I got out of the hospital, there was no alcohol around me, but they did have me on Valium at the time. And I knew that my mom had a bottle of Valium and I'll be damned if I didn't search that house top to bottom for that, for that Valium, even though that's not my story, it doesn't matter. Anything that I could get into my body that was going to take me out of myself, I was going to take it. So it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? So I, you know. That's, I just, I know that any drugs are going to be bad for me just as well as alcohol, you know? Um, so I started drinking, um, three days after I got out of the hospital and, you know, at this point, there's not a lot more drunk log to say other than down I went, um, a f- I ended up moving to Oakland 
um, because a friend of mine from high school reached out to me (laughs) who was already sober and was like, oh my God, I know exactly what you are. You, there's a better way. You know, he was just like, there's a better way if you want it, if you really want it, let me know, you know, if you would like to have a better way. And it was, and it was a long road. It was a long road to me actually getting sober at that point. I, I went to rehab once, um, didn't take the first time. And then I spent in, in Berkeley, I was in options. Um, I got kicked out of options um, I was in Cherry Hill three times that summer of 2014, just over and over, just just back out and back out and back out, couldn't get it together. And when Options, um, I don't know if you guys know this place, Options in Berkeley, that's, you know, um, they have inpa- they have like sort of, you can live there, which is what I was doing, or you can also just like go outpatient kind of thing during the day. Um, I brought alcohol into their building, into their into their facility, into their living quarters, and they were just like, nope. There's no second chance for that. And they dropped me off in front of Highland Hospital at 3 o'clock in the morning, and that was it. I had a backpack and flip-flops, and I didn't have anything. I no longer had anything like, you know, I had already been fired for being drunk. I didn't, I didn't have a job. I didn't have anything at this point. And um, I that's when I hit my knees, finally hit my knees and said, I'll do, I was like, please, God, I'll do anything to stay sober. I'll do anything to stay sober. I can't do it. I'm not doing it. I keep trying and it's not working. And I couldn't stop no matter what I did. I could not stop. And I went back to rehab, um, for 90 days. And that time I went in there on my hands and knees and I said, I'll do whatever you tell me to do anything, you know, I, um, cut off my right arm, you know, whatever it is, I have lost everything at this point. And I, I didn't have I knew it was that or I was going to be living out of my car. Like, you know, and I, I just, for me, that was the bottom. For me, that was my bottom where I just could no longer. Um, and I was tired of being sick all the time. And there was a part of me, even in that moment, that I didn't want to die. Which there's a first time for everything. Like, I didn't want to die. And I didn't want to live like that anymore. I just didn't. I mattered to myself for like a split second, you know, where some grace, whatever, God, whatever, you know, higher power, sorry, um, you know, came to me and said, you need to get your ass back into rehab and like do it for real and sit down um, and stop talking and listen to what they have to say and then take the suggestions and do all the things that they say to do in there. Um. I needed that, you know, I, um, I just went in there that time and I just, but I also didn't, I also realized that I didn't know how to live my life at all. Like I had never grown up. I had never become an adult. I had never, I'd been faking it, like faking myself for so long. I'd been pretending to like know how to be Megan and I really had no idea what I was doing. You know what I mean? And, um, they were, um, I went to a place called Duffy's in, um, Napa Valley, which is awesome. It's 12 step based. And they really prepare you for like, when they let their little birds fly away, they tell you to like, go to meetings, 90 and 90, raise your hand, tell them you're new. Even if you've got 90 days, when you get out of here, still tell them like, you just got out of rehab. They said, go live in an SLE. Boy, did I not want to do that, but I did it anyway. And I stayed in an SLE and I lived with some crazy, crazy people (laughs) in a a sober living for a few months when I first got out of there. But one of the things, like one of the things they said to us when I was in rehab, um, well, they said a lot, we had a lot to, they had a lot to teach us, you know, and, but really as far as like how to do AA, they told us to do four things. They said, get a sponsor, work the steps, go to meetings, be of service, get a service commitment. And sh- shut up. Get a sponsor, go to meetings, work the steps, get a service commitment. It was really what they sort of drilled into my head. And that is exactly what I needed to hear and exactly what I needed to do. Because even though I was like, 
falling down drunk in life, I thought I could somehow knew better that I could somehow fix that thing. And that's just like this hilarious pride that comes along with me being an alcoholic that just makes me think that I know things I don't know and that I know how to solve problems that I don't know how to solve and that my opinion totally matters. And it's so funny because I have a shiny, shiny soapbox that I love to like polish up and get on and tell people exactly what I think they should be doing. And, um, don't ever listen. If I do that seriously to any of you, just don't listen to that. Um, and cause that's, that's just what I do. Um, so now I can look at that with a sense of humor. At the time, I was dragging my knuckles. I was so scared, and I was so sad, and I was so depressed, and I was little. And um, the gift of desperation. One of the most annoying things I ever heard when I first got sober was that I had been given the gift of desperation. And I'm so grateful for it now because I was desperate, and that's the only way I could ever sit down and shut up. Um, because I just didn't – I couldn't think of another way. So, yeah, um, so going to meetings and um, and working the steps and having a sponsor. I've had a couple different sponsors. Um, not because I really wanted to switch sponsors. I hate doing that because it's really terrifying to me to switch sponsors. But I've had to, you know, get new sponsors and stuff over the couple last couple of years. I've been sober. Um, my sobriety date is um, August 25th, 2014. So I have a little over four and a half years. Um, and I've had, a like, I think I'm on my fourth sponsor now. Um, and, and I love her and she's fabulous, but the, you know, and sort of the more I, I work the steps, the more I realize how much I need them because, um, wherever I go in sobriety, I'm still there and I have, um, baggage and feelings and, and I have to be reminded sort of on the daily that a couple different things, one of my couple favorite things that I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous is that feelings don't last forever. And, um, they're certainly not permanent and they don't, they're not a crisis. Like my feelings are not a crisis. I get to, I can just sit there and have them, which I really always thought like there has to be something that I have, this has to go. Like I hated myself. I hated Megan. I hated everything about me. And I did not think I deserved to take up the space that I took up, you know, and I'm just starting sort of recently now being able to be like, oh yeah yes, I do. I get to be here. Like I get to take up the space that I take up. It's okay for me to stand up for myself. It's okay for me to, um, you know, exist, which I really didn't think it was. I really did not think it was okay for me to exist. And I just realized that like a couple of years ago, that that's really what I thought that I just didn't think I belonged here. And, um, so feelings don't last forever <laughs> and they're not a crisis. And, um, I also, I'm trying to see how to say this. Like I, I if I go through each of the steps, you know, I, I, I realize that really my lack, like I, I, putting myself in a humble position is where I belong. It's really, really hard. I either think that I'm, I know better than everyone else, but at the same time that I think I know better than everyone else, I think I'm the biggest piece of shit in the universe, right? So I, I, I have a hard time making, you know, allowing my, the steps and my connection with my higher power to just be like, you're just you. It's not good or bad. It's just you. Like, you're just, you know, this is, it's okay to be you and it's okay to take up the space you take up and it's okay to just be fine, <laughs> I don't have to be extra special and I don't have to be awful. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to learn that too through, you know, working the steps. Um, um, trying to think what else is like, so, I mean, today, you know, like I said, in the very beginning of my share, I have a job, I have a, a I have a car with a payment that's just throws me. It's always tri trips me out that it's something that I do by myself. I don't ask for that for someone else. I, and I don't think I should, I deserve that from someone else. I think I should work for it, you know, and, and have my own job and earn my own money. And I don't think like, I'm not feeling so sorry for myself now that I think other people should be scraping me up off the floor. Like I used to feel, you know, um, I, there was something I wanted to say though. And I can't remember what it was. Cause of course, when I'm in my car, you know, throughout the day before I share, I'm always thinking of these fabulous things that I'm going to say. And then I forget everything when I get in front of people. Um, but 
my new sponsor has me doing this very amazing 10th step that sort of encompasses all the steps. By doing this in this 10th step the way that she has me doing it, it really has me, if I do this 10th step, I'm actually working all the 12 steps every single day and trying to put every single one of those steps into every, you know, into each day of my life. I don't do this perfectly and I don't do it all the time, but I, you know, but I try to just kind of live the, you know, um, the spiritual principles to the best of my ability. Um, when I first came into the rooms, I didn't know what it meant to be spiritual. I had no idea what that could possibly mean. And I wasn't brought up with any sort of religion. So I don't have an issue with the word God, but I didn't think there was anything spiritual about me. And actually at options, um, before I got sober, there was a chaplain there who said, cause I said, I don't know what that means to be spiritual. I'm not spiritual. There's nothing spiritual about me. And she said, write down three people that you admire in this world. And so I wrote them down. And then she said, now write down three characteristics of each of those people that you admire, just characteristics of each of those people. And then I had six characteristics and I said, these are the things that I admire. And she said, that, that's spiritual. Those people, those are spiritual characteristics. Those are what make people spiritual being a decent person. Decency is, is spiritual and it, and and it, it it made her saying that made it that I could see that the principles that come you know that come with the steps are all just about being not a jerk <laughs> and and treating other people with kindness and treating other people with compassion and treating myself with compassion and having an open enough mind and heart to to take in everybody else as opposed to just myself, just accept everybody else, not just me and that everyone else has their own perspective. And then I can actually treat other people with compassion and, um, and then I can help other people. Then I can reach out to the newcomer. Then I can, you know, take those principles and try to put them into my everyday affairs to the best of my ability. And I'm, and I, and I am, I am a snarky, and, and I'm gnarly, you know, sometimes I'm not like perfect at this, but when I can, when I can remember to do that, um, um, it's, it's kind of awesome. And I kind of get chills. I kind of get chills when I'm like, oh yeah, that's the program. I can feel it. All right. You know, I kind of get like really good about it when, when I do it. Um, cool. The other thing I want to say is that, um, prayer and meditation are crucial to my program. I, um, I pray on my knees. I pray on my knees every day. I pray on my knees just to remind myself that I'm not in charge. I have to put my body there, you know, to remind me that I'm not the one calling the shots around here and that I, you know, pray for my higher powers will for me and not mine. And I put myself there and I meditate every day. Um, I add, I'm, I've been adding a minute to my meditation kind of as time goes by, I'm only at seven minutes. Boy, howdy. I don't, it's, it's not easy for me, but I make myself do it anyway. Seven minutes a day right now. We'll see, we'll see if we can make that more. Um, and when I don't do it, I'm not cool. You know what I mean? I either feel crappy and all sad or whatever about myself, or I'm not nice to other people. And I don't like it when I'm not nice to other people because then I suffer the consequences of that. Um, and that praying and meditating really maintaining that con connection with my higher power, really staying connected with the people in the rooms of AA, really working with my sponsor, really caring and working with my sponsees. That is what keeps me sober. And all of the things together combined are the things that keep me sober. And I'm not about to like try to find out which one of them it is that might be keeping me sober by itself. I'm just going to keep doing all the things because it really um, is crucial for me. The, my sobriety is the most important thing in my life. And, um, Without it, I lose the things for sure, but then I really lose myself, you know, and I, now that I'm getting to know myself, I sort of like myself and I don't want to lose that. Um, so, um, I think Zach, is that cool? Are we good? Yeah, for sure. All right. I'm dead. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. 
Thank you very much.